Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, Center for Global Enterprise Expert Connect series. Today we will be discussing the global enterprise, where to now. Uh, we are very pleased that you are able to join us today from all over the world. And uh, <clears throat> this Expert Connect we're doing this morning is obviously on a uh, very timely topic, and we are very fortunate to be able to have this conversation. The Expert Connect, uh, as you know, is being sponsored by the Center for Global Enterprise Global Scholars Program. To give you uh, an update on the Global Scholars Program, it comprises 171 schools from 92 different countries. This Expert Connect on the Global Enterprise, we have the opportunity over the next 90 minutes to speak with Sam Palmazano, Chairman of the Center for Global Enterprise and the former Chairman CEO and President of IBM. Sam, welcome and thank you for being with us. Uh, I want to thank the schools for joining us. University of Surrey Business School in the UK, IESE Business School in Spain, University of Stellenbosch Business School in South Africa, Indian School of Business in India, ESEC Business School in France, and Boston University Questrom School of Business in the US. We received your questions, and what we will do is after some opening remarks by Sam, I will call on you to ask a question, and we will do it in this order. Uh, Surrey, Stellenbosch, Aise, Indian School of Business, ESEC, and Questrom. Surrey, I will come to you first, so please prepare your question to ask Sam, then Stellenbosch, and in the order I just discussed. We will go through a uh, second round of questions and we will try and do as many uh, questions as possible. Also, as I come to you, please introduce yourself and your school. So with that, let's begin. Ira, thank you very much. And everyone, thank you for joining us today. I think Ira uh, is correct. This is a timely time to have these discussions. But I thought the best way to frame the discussion is to go back uh, to the uh, early part of the 21st century. And uh, at that point in time, uh, this is prior to the financial crisis, uh, many of the things around global econ economies, global integration, global companies were certainly uh, performing well at their hiatus, if you look back in time. And the world was continued to advance uh, in their integration economically. Um, you know, hundreds of millions of people were entering the middle class. Many countries were engaging in world trade. Uh, therefore, they were elevating their standards of societal practice as well as employment standards around the world. And that's when I penned this article. And that was in 2006. I thought what I would do is, uh, and I described, which we now refer to as the globally integrated enterprise, which is the future corporate model that was going to be evolving in this environment, as we saw at that <laughs> point in time. I thought I would just take a second and read from the uh, publication, which is called Foreign Affairs, uh, which you can obviously look up so you can see that I'm not recreating history here. Uh, I go back to the last two paragraphs that I wrote, and this is in 2006. I think you'll find it interesting in light of what's going on today. Uh, and, I, and I quote, I'm reading now, the alternative to global integration is not appealing. Left unaddressed, discontent with globalization will only grow. People might ultimately choose to elect governments that impose strict regulations on trade or labor, perhaps of a highly protective sort. Worse, they might gravitate toward more extreme forms of nationalism, xenophobia, anti-modernism. The shift from the multinational corporation to globally integrated enterprises provides an opportunity to advance both business growth and societal progress but it raises issues that are too big and too interconnected for business alone or government alone to solve. The globally integrated enterprise is a promising new actor on the world stage. Now leaders in business, government, education, and all of civil society must learn about its emerging dynamics and help it mature in ways that will contribute to social, economic, and human progress around the planet. Uh, that was in 2006. Clearly, I think the, uh, the prescription wasn't <laughs> taken, or the dosage of, wasn't taken at the right amount, which was collaboration between business and, and governments and society and educational institutions to prepare uh, people in those areas for what opportunities were going to exist in the future. That leads to where we find ourselves today. Uh, and this was 
actually you could forecast this. Uh, groups were being left behind and that only accelerated. And that acceleration of these groups that were being left behind has caused the reaction that we have today that we see on the political stage. It started in the UK with Brexit. It's continued with the US election. We have two elections coming up in Europe uh, that are very prominent, both France and, and Germany. And as we say, we'll see you know, how this continues to, to progress. I think the answer is not necessarily everybody kind of building walls or becoming more regional in their structures. I mean, from the perspective of economic growth and prosperity and advancement of society, I will argue that that's not the appropriate approach. However, I think we do need to understand these divergent factors that are occurring. Uh, one is the one I alluded to, which is the fact that governments are responding in very uh, predictable ways. Uh, because they're reacting to the pressures of their populace. I mean, that's actually what's occurring. That's what politicians do. At the same time, that's one trend, it's one area of force, let's put it that way, uh, of nature. The other area is what's happening with technology. And technology actually is, is really driving more integration. Uh, it's clear in social media kinds of companies, you think about whether that's Facebook or WeChat or Instagram, what have you, all those various types, Twitter, all these various types of media platforms, communications platforms, really are integrating the world technologically. In the corporate sense, you look at these business models that many refer to as platform business models, where you have a common back office, i.e. Uber, Lyft, Airbnb, Cart, etc., cetera, uh, Amazon, Alibaba, what have you. And you have this common back office that by definition is global because it's the same everywhere in the world which we were arguing back in 2006 corporations should do, uh, which is create a common back office, completely different local operations and go to market in connection with society. But the back office should be global, common and scalable. Now the technologies of cloud and big data, all that weren't there at that point in time. But if you do that today, this is what you would do. And that's what you see in these platform uh, based companies. That's, what, that's their back office. It's their support system, it's their reservation to get the car, to get the room, to go order your groceries, you know, whatever it happens to be. So you have two factors in the technology. <coughs> One is this fact that the world is interconnected, ideas, ideas are being shared. We can talk about the quality of those ideas, we can talk about whether they're factually accurate, what have you, but the fact of the matter is information is disseminating very, very quickly. Uh, and and almost in many ways, there, it goes so fast, it's almost out of control. The other side of it, the business model, quite honestly, it's a technology that now is enabling global entities. Because you, you don't have to be large and scalable like an IBM or an ExxonMobil, uh, let's say, or a large Chinese uh, uh, CNUC, a big petroleum <laughs> company, a natural resources company in China. We can go on around the world, um, or Siemens in Germany, et cetera. You could do this as a startup. You don't have to wait to be 100 years old like IBM to decide to tackle this task. Uh, you can do this day one, and that's what you see happening in these models evolving on the business platforms. So you have these divergent forces, and this for, because they diverge, they're causing tensions. And that's where we find ourselves today. We have these tension points. Now, people want to quickly declare that global business is dead, it's over, <laughs> Corporations are done, it's done, it's over. Everything's gonna happen within your borders. We're gonna build walls around everything. Every country's gonna have a wall. Trust me, it never happens that way. Uh, it won't happen this time that way. I mean, it's hard to predict what's going to happen, which causes a lot of uncertainty, which causes crazy predictions to occur. Uh, but fundamentally, we'll have to see how this thing actually shakes out. We will make the argument that the most progressive way to advance for society, and that's a global point of view of society, not one nation's view of society, is to keep the world connected. It's better for safety of all, fewer wars if you like, less terrorism if you keep the world connected. A good way to connect the world is economically through commerce, because if you have shared interests that are economic in nature, you won't blow up your own properties, for example. I mean, if you're a foreign entity and you own property in the United States, you're not gonna blow it up, you know, right? Nor, nor would any other country blow up their own assets. I mean, it's a, it's a crude example, I, I'll admit that. 
But, you know, I used to, when I lived in Tokyo and we would go to Hawaii, when you looked at all the property that were owned by the Japanese, you certainly didn't think they would blow it up in the future since they owned all the property. You know, they probably would blow themselves up. Uh, I mean, very simple example, but economic integration is actually good from a, I'll call it a geopolitical stability perspective. It's also good because it lifts people. It lifts them economically, it lifts, it lifts them intellectually, it improves their quality of life, health care, housing, retail, all those things improve. That's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with that. However, the challenge associated with that, you cannot leave people behind. So I'll make the same argument today as I made back in 2006. The solution here is that governments, educational institutions, and business, people with economic interest, have to come together and solve this problem. If it doesn't get solved, what we see today, I believe, will only worsen. If it does get solved, I believe we'll have a much brighter future. So with that, I'll open it up to questions, and I'll pass it back to you. Okay, great. Well, let me follow up on, on that. So we, we've got these two opposing forces. Uh, economic. Apparently, there's been some problems. Like, all the schools have been struggling. We've been on the chat here, and unfortunately, we could maybe get maybe 50 or 60 percent of, of, of the introduction. <laughs> okay. <laughs> let, let me but, Do you want me to ask a question? Maybe you can wait for I'll quickly summarize, sure. and it'll lead to the question. Basically, what I said in the beginning was that we forecasted in an article on globally integrated enterprise and foreign affairs in 2006 that if business, government, and academia did not come together, we'd have the circumstances we have today. And that's we find ourselves 10 years later with regionalization as a more populous form of, of elections or campaigning, let's say, than we've had historically. So that's kind of where we are. And there's two factors at, for, at play here. One is that political factor at play. And then there's the technology factor at play, which is globally scaling and integrating everyone, whether that's social media, platform, business models, together. And governments are struggling with this issue of globalization and people left behind and trying to come up with strategies that will serve their societies, but maybe not be the- Try and, and continue. And try question. Yeah, and I'll ask, uh, well, I was going to ask Sam about uh, these uh, opposing forces. So we have uh, social and economic, political and economic issues that are retrenching from openness. Right. And at the same time, we have technology that is bringing us all together in many different ways, as you cite in your article, uh, entertainment, social uh, media. Uh, it, it, it's actually phenomenal the way things are, are changing and the way we're able to, to link with each other. So what are the, the challenges or, or for, um, for government, for uh, business managers, and, and also, I guess, what advice would you have for, for schools as they grapple right. with this, this issue? Well, I think whether it's <clears throat> IRA, whether it's business, or whether it's government, it depends where you are. I mean, if you are part of a mature society where you feel that you've been left behind by globalization, or businesses that are regional who have been left behind, you'll have a point of view. However, if you're a benefactor of it, an emerging geography who uh, engaged in the world economy, either through skilled people or through natural resources, they were the two primary vectors of the past, but you have a different view, which you see happening live. What's the example? President Trump talks about being much more regional, America first. Uh, President Xi of China talks about becoming the global leader. This changed in 30 days. 30 days. The world would flip upside down. Uh, so I start with where are you positioned? And the answer, quite honestly, uh, from an economic perspective and from a societal perspective, is not to retrench. The answer is to solve the problem. Right? Now we get back to business. So you solve the problem. Because retrenchment doesn't solve the problem. It might delay or slow down the inevitable. The inevitable will occur. Because if you have a low growth environment, your wages will deteriorate, your infrastructure will collapse. I mean, this is what happens, right? 
um, in the past would lead to wars. Well, we don't have wars anymore, hopefully, right? So it causes other kinds of problems. Now, from the business perspective, again, I think you have the short term and then the long term. I'll start with the long term. The long term, there are some inevitable factors that you cannot avoid to miss. And what I mean by that is there's massive growth of the middle class around the world. So if you're in Northern Europe or in the United, you're a company in the United States or Northern, let's say North America, you cannot miss that trend because you need the growth. So you have to pursue that trend. Oh, that's population demographic expansion. The other side of it is technology. When you see these business models, um, whether that be the media industry or retail with Amazon or Alibaba or transportation with Uber or Lyft or with uh, lodging, uh, Airbnb, et cetera, and all the alternatives around the world, basically you have to understand that. Mm -hmm. One is, let's say you're a startup. Tremendous opportunity, opportunity everywhere. Go create your African version or go create your Asian version, Indian version, whatever it happens to be, it's a wonderful opportunity if you're an entrepreneur in those parts of the world. However, if you are in the lodging business or the taxi business or the retail business, right, you have a different set of challenges. And that is how do you take advantage of these technologies to advance your business model so that you're not disintermediated by the emerging technologies. So that, again, I think the way you have to think about it is where are you positioned? Where, where are you as a society or a country? And where are you as a business? And that dictates the strategy you have to establish. There's not one for all as you look at this. But at the end of the day, these forces that are driving change, it's more technology than it is about low-cost labor. It's more about productivity and advancement than it is about the cost of the natural resource. I mean, why are natural resource costs coming down? Because of technology called fracking. Why, is, why, are automotive, or why are production facilities today so much more advanced? Because it's technologies like 3D printing and robotics. It's somewhat to do with labor costs, but that's like 15 or 20 percent of it. 80 percent is driven off of technological innovation. And that's what you need to understand as a student or a future business leader is how do you take advantage of that? Or even as a government leader, how do you understand that and encourage that so you can prepare your society to be the most competitive in these environments? Over, Sam, uh, over the last 10 years or the decades since you wrote the, the first article and, and basically uh, coined the phrase uh, globally integrated enterprise, uh, we've seen demand shift from supply side to basically consumer or basically the uh, demand, 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 right, yeah, right. The demand side uh, world. How is that challenging businesses today and changing the way they operate? Well, the challenge for business is, especially if you're producing a good and a service, which most people do one or the other, right? It is a huge challenge to your supply chain. Supply chain, I mean, this sounds like a very mundane topic, but in the business schools, you learn about operations and supply chains. My, have one child who went to get his MBA, I have another one in Boston getting his MBA. I look at their curriculum, what they call operations. It's fundamentally supply chain. Kind of a mundane topic, but it's about, if you're a company, it's 50 to 60% of your cost of your supply chain. And if you get it wrong, like in your consumer electronics, and you get it wrong, you have too much inventory. Or if you're in retail, you have too much inventory, which means you have to sell it at any price which guarantees you a bad start to the following year. I guarantee you, nothing you can do. And that was back to the supply side model of supply chain. To your point, Ira, there were all these estimates. They weren't based on individual consumer taste. They were based on macroeconomic factors and your success in the past. You built these models. You had an industry estimate. I was in the PC business. I ran PCs for IBM. This is more consumer than enterprise because enterprise was more predictable. You'd have your, your share percentage, you'd have industry growth estimates, you'd have macroeconomic factors per capita income for regions of the world. That would lead to how many PCs you would build. So we're gonna build 10 million PCs. 
Well, if we only sold 8 million, you're writing 2 million of them off, right? Because every six months is a new product cycle. That's the supply side. Now you can connect through analytics to these actual shifts in consumer sentiment and taste, right? You can adjust based upon demand. You can digitalize your supply chain. If you are in fashion, let's say, you literally could uh, digitalize or, or through uh, virtual reality visualization techniques, create the next cycle of product, your new line for the spring fashion. You can connect that line all the way through to your manufacturing facilities, through your suppliers, and you know immediately what your lead times are going to be, what your costs will be, what the price should be, and you're closer to, I won't say it's perfect, but you're closer to the sentiment that's shifting these trends that sh move every cycle. So that's the difference yes, today. So you, uh, you talked earlier about um, the, the end of globalization. We've seen a lot of stories about um, global companies right. and retrenchment, and um, I'd like to explore a little bit more why you don't think that will be um, a factor or that will happen as, as the pundits are, are predicting and uh, right. the political and social movements we're seeing today to close borders and to retrench from trade right. agreements? Well, first of all, we really don't know what these guys are going to do. The governments, I mean. We know what speeches they've given. That doesn't mean that's what they're going to do. I mean, I've been around this thing a very long time, okay? And I just spent five hours in that big house in Washington Monday of this week, okay? So you have to separate yourself from the speech to the reality. Brexit doesn't really mean the UK doesn't get connected for trade around the world. Now we'll see how it gets implemented. I mean, I don't think anyone really knows at this point in time. I don't think anyone really knows in the United States what's going to happen in Congress. I mean, the president can't dictate the changes that he can give in a speech. I know he'd like to. His, his predecessors all would be aspirationally would like to be kings. But the United States is not a, a monarchy. It's a constitutional democracy. There's three branches of government. So you have to watch how it plays out. So my first reaction is the short term, which I talked about earlier, I really spent more time on the long term. The short term, I believe, if, if you're in business, and I advise businesses today, if I was still running the business, it would be the same advice for me, is just keep your powder dry. Don't react, right? Don't reallocate your assets in your supply chain. That's massive capital movement. It takes time to do those sorts of things. On your example of supply, move a factory, build a factory. That's years, right? You're moving capital and, and right. facilities. Don't do it. Let's see what really happens. When they don't sign up for these global trade deals, but they replace it with bilaterals, bilateral trade agreements, in many cases, that's better. I mean, my experience from a business perspective, in many of the relationships that were established, bilateral was better for business versus these global multilaterals. I mean, that was just a historic fact. So, you know, you can't say, well, because it's going to be bilateral versus this big thing, I wouldn't react to that. I mean, I'd wait to see what actually happens versus what people were saying. Now, I mean, who knows? I mean, it's too much uncertainty in the short term is my only point of view, so I would stay quiet. I wouldn't make proclamations like people have made. I think business shouldn't make proclamations unless they're constructive ones. I don't think business should make commitments uh, for a soundbite on television or a Twitter feed that they really aren't going to live up to. I mean, no different than a politician shouldn't, nor should a business leader. I mean, they should be committing things that they are certainly going to live up to not for their PR or marketing purposes. Uh, that's different. Uh, I don't believe that you could come up with some of these statements that are being made in 60 days on the commitments that are being made, unless they were already planned and in the budget cycle. These large companies, their budget cycles, as you know, run annually or biannually, right? The fact that in eight days they'd have a new plan, eh, I'm a little cynical about that. Sorry, are you ready to ask a question? Yes, we are. Sorry about the technical. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> we missed a bit of the first uh, session of your presentation, so bear with us if we ask a question that you will probably have explained. My name is Dennis Aguba. I'm an MBA full-time student. These are my colleagues. 
My question is, you say that, and I quote, I believe business and government must have a shared objective. They must bring people together on a global and national level to create a collaborative, progressive, and balanced path forward. As we can see now, political parties, mostly in the West, express opinions that lead to uncertainty about safety, xenophobia, nationalism, and there are many people that accept these. Do you believe that the benefits of globalization can conquer these perceptions? If not, what concept do you think will come after globalization? Well, I think we know, I think we can be comfortable with the fact that if some of these statements become reality, that's very negative for everyone. I mean, I think they can, we can get agreement anywhere in the world on that statement. Some of the comments they make that are very prejudicial are clearly not good for people anywhere in the world. I mean, so if we're gonna get agreement on that simple premise that that's a very negative thing, that doesn't help your society or any other society, then we have to get down to what do you do about that? The question isn't that statements are being made or have been made. Now people have to govern. We'll see what really happens that they're governing, not giving political speeches. But my point being is that what do you do about that? Since we know that's not the most positive strategy, so what is a positive strategy? Well, this is where I say business has to engage more so than ever before. There, we can talk about ways to do that because uh, that varies around the world based on uh, the structure of governments and the leadership of governments. It varies with uh, think tanks, academic institutions. I mean, there are multiple different techniques that we could discuss, but we're getting really into the mud. But without going down into the, really the detailed levels, business has to engage and put forward a more positive dialogue, right? I believe that's very, very important, more important today than when I was a CEO. That doesn't mean you argue with them. Having a positive point of view doesn't mean you do things to try to counter the government leadership, or embarrass government leadership, or any of those sorts of things. It just means you make the case for why the world and your geography is better off in this future environment where people come together and work together and solve these problems than the other environment where they separate themselves and tried to create their own little islands. We'll have 200 islands in the world versus 200 nations in the world that are interconnected through trade and education, and those sorts of things. I, that's how I would think about it. And, and at CGE, we're thinking about creating some intellectual work to make the case. Uh, businesses could use the case. They could not use the case. But we're, so organizations need to make the case, right? Now, again, I say it, it varies by part of the world as to how you make the case, right? So there's not going to be one uniform strategy that you could work in the U.S. that's going to work in the U.K. or in Africa or in France or in Germany or China, whatever. So you have to have kind of a global point of view, understanding there are regional uh, subtleties that you have to adjust to. Um, I can give you examples of what we've done in the past around innovation and how we worked with governments and transforming educational systems and the like, but it's those sorts of things that you have to do. Um, yeah, thanks, Laura. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Um, our question is a lot more pragmatic. Uh, a lot of our students are wondering in the article after the reading that uh, what the skills are that you think MBA students of the future would require. Uh, probably a lot more than you're learning in class today. No, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm teasing. Uh, uh, well, I have children in MBA schools, and you might view them as very high-end MBA schools. Uh, some of the things that they're learning are very good historically, but aren't so good going out 20 years, right? That's, that's the challenge uh, as you look to the future, right? But my point is, I think the skills that you need to come away with is, first of all, I don't believe you can start a business today that's not going to be impacted by global factors of some kind. It could be competition. It could be opportunity. It could be government regulation. But I sincerely believe, and I'm involved with a dozen startups, right? Every one of these startups, even the ones that are less than two years old with 20 people, are being impacted of some form of globalization. 
even if it's as simple as the talent pool, the engineering talent. It can be that simple. Or it can be more complex, like market access. They have a platform, but they can't get distribution into some countries. It could be a little more complicated, right? It could be policy around data protection. You have a platform, you want your data to be shared globally, and you have restrictions in the EU and places like that. China, Russia, et cetera. Not just the EU, there are lots of examples of these restrictions. My point is that you need to understand, you need to think as a, assuming you're gonna start a company or go into an existing company, you have to have this point of view that you're operating on a global stage. And you have to understand what that means. So you have to be sensitive to diversity. You have to be respectful of other, other people's ethnic backgrounds. You have to understand cultural subtleties. There's all those sorts of things. Other than be really good at math, so you go into finance, or be really good at design, or, or conceptual, so you go into marketing, or really good at engineering. You know, so you write some software, and you tweet, and you play some video games, you know, like, uh, words with friends or something like that, right? I mean, or Instagram, put your photos up. I mean, phenomenal, phenomenal. Impact society, right? Put some photos up, right? I mean, so you have to really have this perspective of you're in a global world day one. Not like IBM 50 years later. Day one, you're in a global world. Day one, you're gonna be driven by technology. Your business model is gonna be either enhanced or inhibited by technological shifts. You need to understand those technological shifts. So let's go back to the curriculum. So what do you need to know? Well, how much time do you spend on these global societal shifts? I don't know. I've only looked at two elite business schools in their curriculum. I haven't seen it yet. Uh, when you talk about operations, do you talk about digital demand-driven supply chains? Or do you talk about supply chains that existed for me 15 years ago when I was in the PC business before we sold it? What are you studying? I, what my children are studying is not the future. They're studying what I did 20 years ago. It's called the case study methodology. Now, maybe I shouldn't go to the top five business schools of the world that we work with. I should just take the ones that are in the bottom tier and work with them. Maybe they have a different curriculum. I don't know. My only point being is I'm not, and I know you think I'm being sarcastic. I'm not. I'm just trying to point out the fact that you need to prepare yourselves while you have this wonderful time in school other than make great friends with really smart people. That's really important. That's going to sustain a lot of your success in the future. So don't discount that. You want to have great relationships with really smart people. That's important. However, while you have this two years or 18 month break, I would really focus on as best you could these huge shifts that are occurring. Global societal shifts and technological shifts and how do they intersect? Because through those intersections, opportunities are gonna be created. And that's where you wanna get yourself positioned, either personally, because that'll be opportunity for you, or as a company, because that's opportunity for the company. But those intersection points are going to be where you will be of uh, the greatest value. If I could follow right. up. Um, so does it matter if you study finance or you study marketing or, or strategy? Uh, really what you're saying is that the softer skills are what you should look at. You, you, Ari, you need some deep set of skill. I mean, you, you have to have, you know, because people are going to hire you into the entity with some set of skills, right? So you, it could be finance, it could, which could take you to, to consulting or to corporate strategy, you know, business modeling, finance, et cetera. That takes you to, say, one of the big six consulting firms, right. which then puts you in the corporate strategy, which then puts you in the operations at some point in the future. So you need that set of skills. However, I believe the differentiating factor in the long term are going to be the softer skills interpersonal relationships, multinational, global uh, uh, leadership in the sense that you can paint a vision that's understood by 20 different cultures that all come together that follow you as the Pied Piper, not just the people of your like background who like to play beer pong and drink in a pub. You know, right? They might have different interests, right? But you have to relate to all those interests because uh, you have to bring these people together. 
And you're going to be all, all of you are going to be working in these multinational groups. I'll give you a, a one example about one of my children who's not working. And he was with a, one, of, one of the most prestigious consulting firms after coming out of the top business schools, right? And everybody on his team, uh, a lot of the people on his team were Asian, you know, multicultural, but Asian, you know, Chinese, Indian, Korean, et cetera, Asian. And he, he was said, geez, they're so much smarter. They're so much better at math than I am, Dad. They're so much better in math than I am. And I said to him, I said, Christopher, there's other thing that has to happen here. I said, don't ever forget the fact that somebody has to work with the client and get the money. So who gets the money? The mathematician or the person with the interpersonal skills? He goes, I got my role. Yeah, your job is to go get the money. And without the money, they can't do the math. So I make that as an example that all these skills are necessary, Ira. None are more important than the others in these relationships or these teams as you build them. But you're going to find that you need all those things. In a startup, early phase, tech startups, heavy engineering bias, low general management this okay. market, very low, but very heavy engineering. Five to ten years into their cycles, it flips as they have to scale. It completely flips as they have to scale. So my point being is that those skills are going to be required at different points in time depending upon where you are. But the most important thing, I believe, is your ability to get people to work together, to collaborate, to be persuasive with your ideas. There's no command and control hierarchy anymore. So you have to do it through your thinking and through your communications capability. I would, that's the soft Great. skills. Your background, it's the soft skills, right? Thank you, very it, soft. It just, you needed it today, <laughs> not 30 years ago, Ira. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, let's go to uh, Aise. Thank you for spending the time with us. Uh, my name is Massimo Maloret. I'm a professor in strategy here at the school. Um, I'll let, uh, actually, Tobias, one of our students, we are having MBA students here. Tobias has the first question for you, so I'll let him ask the question. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So my question is, um, how does the government of the future look like? And like to back up a little bit, I think my question is more like, how do we manage to make governments more agile to react to the technological progress we see? So for instance, I think this technological progress will eventually lead to high unemployment, especially in the low labor skill, which would kind of fire up the social pressure we saw, which will lead to populism. And I mean, I don't want to go too much into politics here, but the results of um, populism we saw in the US with Mr. Trump, we have the UK, we have France, France getting popular, and we have also upcoming elections in Germany. So from your point of view, how can we in the future prevent this, this, um, this movement? And if I may interject, uh, unfortunately, we could not hear much of the first 15 minutes, so you, you might have touched okay. upon right. a couple of these points, but literally it was uh, right. extremely hard to understand, and I think the other schools uh, were in the same position. So, okay. Uh, I'm sorry about that, and, and, uh, and, and if so, uh, we could sort of uh, connect back to, yep. to how it was. I, I, but uh, yeah, I can connect the two things, because in the beginning, I forecasted in an article in 2006, that if these issues weren't addressed, we'd have the problems that we have today. We just happen to have them today. The, the forecast was seems pretty obvious at that point in time. I was hopeful that it would not occur, but it occurred. Then the question is, now that we find ourselves here, what is the answer? First of all, no different with society, it also starts with political leadership. Political leadership needs to understand what's happening versus what they're seeing. They're seeing displacement. They think it's because the world globalized and jobs moved around the world. And that's a piece of it. But the majority of it is technology. I mean, there's studies, and there are a lot, econo the economists, there are zillions of studies that say 80% is driven off of innovation. 20% is driven off of labor cost. And up, and innovation is on steroids. I mean, it's going very, very quickly. I say on steroids, but it's going very fast. It's accelerating. So they need to become much more technologically aware. Now, I understand that if you're later in life, like me, that can be hard to do. However, you can surround yourself with people who are 
technologically aware who could help you understand these implications and what your policy should be so that you can make progress. I mean, that's the constructive way forward. That doesn't mean that's what will get you elected. I understand if you want to get elected, you might campaign on a different platform. But what happens the day after you're elected, you now own the problem that you have to solve. And what you got, your speech that got you elected will not solve the problem. So if you really want to contribute and give back to your society or your nation as its leader, I believe you need to either educate yourself on what's really going on or surround yourself with people who understand what's really going on and give them a significant role to assist you in moving your nation forward versus backwards. I mean, take the Trump administration. This is not visible to any of you, on, I'm sure, on this broadcast. I happened to be there for five hours in the White House on Monday. There are probably, gosh, dozens of people in their 30s in very influential roles that are looking at things like how do you re-engineer government processes to make them more digitally aware? I mean, they're running around all over the building, all over the West Wing, they call it. Now, you never see that. It might never happen, I don't know, but at least there's an effort underway. There's a whole group of women who came from Wall Street and Goldman Sachs who are working on women empowerment and women entrepreneurship from a policy perspective. Again, you never hear that, but it's a whole portion of the building. And they're all, the oldest one I think is 40 or something like that. They look really young, I don't know, I'm an old guy, but they're, they're young, I mean, they're a lot younger than me. Uh, so my point being is that it's a, it's a small example of if you don't necessarily, I would, now what would I do if I was wherever in the world? I would try to educate whomever it happens to be, La Pen, Trump, Mrs. Clinton, whomever, right? Uh, actually, Angela Merkel, actually, I used to work with her a lot. She really got all this stuff, so she doesn't need a lot of education. She was a physicist by training. Most people were lawyers by training, so it's a little, or now they're golf course developers by training, right? So, you know, it's a different set of skills. But, I mean, and also, I used to work a lot with Tony Blair when he was running, Prime Minister of the UK. He got this stuff, you know, right? But you need, they all need to understand it. Thank you. All right, let's go to uh, Indian School of Business. Uh, uh, I had a question, one, one of the questions was similar to what they asked about the government of the future. The other one was uh, uh, all these Uber, a Airbnb, all these platforms. So they have done, uh, they have helped solve problems in both emerging and uh, uh, developed economies. But uh, we still have uh, certain technologies like cryptocurrencies and uh, Bitcoin, uh, uh, like another word for it, which are uh, not yet there. I mean, do you foresee any changes in these uh, in these industries, manufacturing or uh, uh, Bitcoin and all these crypto all these cryptocurrencies? Well, Bitcoin being the company, you know, okay, Bitcoin's the company. Blockchain's the technology that underpins. Yeah, sorry. Blockchain. Yeah, is the ledger-based mm -hmm. system. Uh, yeah. I think you have to take them at, at various points of view, right? Uh, they're slightly different, but fundamentally, if you look at a lot of these companies that they've created, these cloud-based platforms that enable their businesses, uh, I think that's going to continue to move very, very quickly. Where has it been the most successful or where it's it had the most impact? Media, by far, has been the, the, the most significant. Retail, because you have the, you call it the category killers, the Amazons, the Alibabas, the carts, now maybe not yet in India, but growing very quickly, right? So. Those are two primary industries. As you move down that scale, and you get to your point, as you get into finance, insurance, manufacturing, you see less of these effects. So let's talk a little bit about blockchain as an enabling technology for distributed value exchange. That's really what it does. I mean, we talk about today in the form of currencies, you know, exchanging currencies, multi-currency exchange around the world, wiring services, et cetera. 
um, you know, or peer-to-peer -peer lending or peer-to-peer -peer, uh, value exchange. I use the term value exchange because it doesn't necessarily have to be money. We just think of money as value. There can be other kinds of value exchange. And what happens in the technology, it enables that exchange in a very safe and secure way. That's what it does. Uh, it also does it at a lot lower cost than the current system. But that's more about the current system's design than the cost of a blockchain implementation. And by that I mean, because of these industries are so, finance and insurance are so heavily regulated, there's so many uh, intersection points you have to pass through. And as you pass through, everything is added on. Cost plus profit keeps added, being added on. And then you get to a more expensive cost, you know, 3% or 4% to move the money versus less than 1% if you move it through not just Bitcoin or Circle D or the bunch of these companies that let you do those kinds of things. But it's driven off of the industry structure more so than the technology. So the key, now if you're thinking about the perspective, I want to get involved in some of these technology-based companies, I would encourage you, and I'm an investor in some, uh, but I would, and the technologies are terrific, but you need to understand the industry dynamic and the reg regulatory environment that you'll be entering into. And that's different all over the world. I mean, so as I say this, there's not one that's this by, it's, they're different by country, not even by, say, Northern Europe, Northern North America, Southeast Asia, whatever. It's different by country. The regulations are different by country. In the United States, they're different by state within a country. So you have 50 states that are different than the country. So you need to understand both sides of these implications, not just the technology. The technology is terrific. It value can be exchanged on blockchain. It is much more secure than the current systems. It's a much lower cost point for the value that's exchanged. However, you, know, you have to put that in the context of where it's being deployed. The other thing you also have to consider is, uh, I'll give you an example, which gets back to regulation. Uh, we worked very closely with Bardi in India, so, and Sunil Mittal is a very close personal friend of mine. And we had a phenomenal, phenomenal business model for Bardi Airtel in India. And for a dollar, you know, of your, uh, whatever it was, a minute or hour of cell phone usage, probably was an hour if it was a dollar, he could make 50 cents on the dollar. The US, the same price point was seven, and they could make 20 cents on seven dollars. So my argument to Sunil was, we ought to take your model and take it to the United States. And actually, it was like $11 in Germany, and you made like 10 cents. So why don't we take the model and take it elsewhere? And he was right. He said, Sam, you have to understand that all these telco industries by country are regulated, and I have to get tariffs, permission to to enter, it's called a tariff, right? And I can't get tariffs. Or the tariffs could cost me so much because the, the telcos are owned by the government, Deutsche Telekom, it's, I'm not picking on Deutsche Telekom, I'm just saying they're owned by the government, you know, right? That therefore, it's not really a private open market. I use it as a case study as to why technology, even though we did some incredible things to allow him for a dollar to make 50 cents within the technology on how he, loyalty management, how you got more subscribers, et cetera, et cetera, how you did the music, the sound bites for your phone, all that, right? We did all those things together, but the point of it was that it wasn't necessarily something you could take around the world because you had different industry regulatory structures. That's just my example, an Indian example for you based upon a model we're talking about. Thank you. All right, uh, Isak. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I question um, based on your comments uh, you talk about two different types of changes or shifts one in technology and one in um, global societal shifts and I was wondering if you comment a little little bit about how you see uh, businesses um, reaction uh, to these changes or what impact does it have on global business do you anticipate firms reacting similarly to different types of shocks or or how should they tailor their responses to different types of right. particularly technology versus society? Right. right. So they're, they're two separate things. One is they're both very hard to do. But the first one is let's start with technology. As a business leader, 
people on this, this little conference we're having, this little lecture series, right, need to understand the implications of these technologies. Platforms, blockchain, 3D printing, you know, I can go on, fracking, we can go, you know, uh, molecule management if you're a biotech. Well, you need to understand the implications of those technologies. It doesn't mean you have to be a technologist. It means you have to understand the implications if you're going to manage something that's going to be technology driven. And in the future, I can't think of many things that aren't. I mean, if you want to fix the healthcare system in the United States or in the UK, you get, technology is the answer. I mean, it's not going to be, you know, more people running around uh, that they can charge into a system that's already inefficient and unprofitable. You know, it's going to be technology-based solutions, whether that's in diagnostics or whether that's in the reducing the cost of the drugs, whatever it happens to be. So you have to be an understanding of the implications. You have to understand how to take advantage of these shifts, but doesn't mean you have to be a technologist. Uh, hard but easier than the next one. Because the next one you have to be, I'll call it agile and ambidextrous. You have to understand the, the world that you're operating within, and it's not one. We talk about the global economies and how they've become much more integrated today. That is true. But cultural value and societal value has not become one. So that if you are, which we used to say when we were doing it at IBM, creating the global integrated enterprise, I said you had to be locally relevant. You had to align with societal needs. Sometimes that's education and skills development. China was our strategy, education, skills development. Sometimes it's environment. Brazil, rainforest. Sometimes it's personal safety. Crime center in Sao uh, San Paulo, right? No, in Rio, Rio de Janeiro. So, it varies, is my only point. Uh, it was clean water, Galway Bay. Uh, it was traffic congestion, Stockholm, Singapore, those kinds of things. So the, your connection was different. Now, the technology solutions that we were offering were 70% of that was the same, and 30% we'd have to modify. But the core was basically the same, the majority of what we were providing. But you had to connect. You had to care. And your local leaders had to care about those cultures and those societies. You could not just be a multinational that was distributing product for economic gain. And I made that speech for 20 years when I was my last 20 years at IBM. In every country, we would demand on how they were going to locally connect. When I would meet with Sarkozy in France, we'd go through an innovation strategy. Right? When I spent the weekend at Checkers with Prime Minister Blair and his wife, we had a different strategy because we had a lab called Hursley in the UK. I mean, so when I would sit down uh, with Win and Hu in China talking about the globalization of the PC industry and the creation of a company called Lenovo, it was a different strategy. Okay, right? My only point was that you, these are just examples. Of, they're all real examples, by the way. It's no embellishment here. They're all for, I know you guys think I'm making up, I'm hanging around with all these people. I'm not, I'm really not. Hang, I mean, I'm making any of this up. It's all, it's all in the historical records. But you had to, it's true, but you had to relate to their needs and their concerns. That doesn't mean if they're doing bad things, the guys I picked weren't doing bad things. If they're doing bad things, you don't have to do that, by the way. And I've had a lot of people around the world, when I was working, ask me to do things that weren't in our value system. Doesn't say they were illegal, but they weren't in the IBM value system. Uh, they might have been legal in their culture, in their country, but they weren't appropriate in, in our view of the world and what was right for people of the world. So we wouldn't do it. Um, and I don't want to give you those examples because some of those guys are still in power and they have large militaries and I'm, I don't have any protection anymore. So I won't <laughs> give you those examples. Thank you. And I'm glad you're safe. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Why don't you go ahead? I'm a faculty member at Question. I am alone without students, not because of lack of student interest, but because the students are on spring break. Um, <laughs> but nonetheless, a number of them sent in uh, what I thought were pretty uh, thought-provoking questions. So I'll select one that I think uh, fits uh, the discussion so far and which hasn't, um, hasn't been raised yet. And it, it describes uh, the tension um, in globally integrated enterprises between on one hand being a force 
for global integration and for spreading sort of trade around the world and improving technology around the world. While at the same time, such globally integrated enterprises are often extremely large and are often oligopolists, which have the ability to influence domestic policy, sometimes in protectionist ways. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about a few examples of how globally integrated enterprises manage that tension between pushing for greater integration on one hand, but also pushing for protection for their particular interests okay. within a country. Well, that's actually, I mean, if that came from a student, you had to give that guy an A plus, because <laughs> that is a great question. An undergraduate student. Really? Good for the Talk a lot with them about non-market strategy. Yeah, yeah, good for he or she, or she whomever. Um, I, I tell you that we, I have a bias, right? But I, I, and I can understand why people argue in their interest. We always felt that we should take the position that was good for society. And if it was good for society, then we would have permission to operate. I used to make the argument with government leaders, all I want is a level playing field. So you have your, you, they all have national heroes. It's not, this isn't new. I can take you back to the end of World War II. You know, I can go back to what Watson did, the end of World War II. I mean, I've studied all this stuff being part of IBM, right? There's always a national hero. Uh, we dealt with the Japanese, Fujitsu, Hitachi, NEC. We dealt with the Lucky Ghost Star, Samsung's in Korea. We've dealt with, you know, you'll have local heroes today, uh, ZTE, um, uh, Huawei, et cetera, in China, Lenovo in China, whatever. So we always had these things. You always had local heroes around the world. You had them in, you had P Apricot in the UK for PCs. There's all these, these things that would always lobby for their own uh, advantage within their geography. Now, I would always argue that, guys, all we want is a level playing field. We will invest at their levels. The Indian companies in India, uh, <coughs> you know, Wipro, et cetera. Uh, I said, so look, we'll invest. I'll put 50,000, 80,000 people in India. They have 10,000 in India, right? So I'll put a manufacturing facility in Tokyo. These guys manufacture offshore. So, I mean, but just make it a level playing field. Don't give them any price advantage. Don't give them procurement advantage. And we'll go compete. And you're going to be better off because you'll get more value. You will get more value. Society gets more value. We've added 80,000 jobs in India, 50,000 jobs in China. The society gets more value. You have better price points if you're the government. You have better quality, lower cost. Everybody's better off. Having said that, right, this is what, this is what you have to deal with. That's the position that IBM would take because we had the scale to compete. However, having said that, and you see it in the United States as well, by the way, you could talk about export of natural gas versus the chemical industry versus the gas producers. I mean, you, there's a lot, I mean, that's a current example as of like today, you know, right? The chemical guys don't want the uh, natural resources guys exporting because they don't want the prices of natural gas in the U.S., which is lowest by far in the world, to go up to the worldwide price. I mean, it's happening here as well. So it's not, you know, all my only point is it's not just strictly overseas. My point being, though, is that the, the country, the, those companies themselves, it, it, again, it depends on where you are. But let's assume for a second they have to be competing. Forget globally, IBM in 170 countries, ExxonMobil in 210 countries, Coke in 217 countries. You know, say they're in 30 countries, 20 countries, right? You can't argue for favoritism in your country of origin and then complain in the countries that you say are restrictive. So if the U.S. gives you an incentive, you can't go to the EU and say, hey, wait a minute, EU, you're helping whomever. Because at the end of the day, they're going to come back and say, well, wait a minute, whoa, whoa, your, your government helped you here, so we're helping them there. And then when you look at this thing from a science, economic perspective, how much of your business is going to be your home country versus your international operations? In IBM's example, 67% uh, of our revenue was non-U.S. and 65% of our workforce was non-U.S. It's even more for a natural resources company. Any one of them, Total, I mean, I, I could use ExxonMobil, I could use Chevron, you could take Shell, BP, it's even more. So, so you are, in, even though you might get some short-term benefit, in the long term, when the countries adjust to what the U.S. policy was, you are going to be impacted as well. So the most, 
thoughtful way to approach it, I believe, and I think they will learn in time the best way to approach it, is argue for a level playing field. Now, when you argue for a level playing field, that means you have to be excellent in operations. I mean, if you're going to take on a national hero, uh, like we did in Japan, versus the, they call them plug compatible computer manufacturers, Fujitsu, Amdahl, Hitachi, etc., and then Nippon Electric, right? You have got to be better with technology, cost points, price, customer support to win. So if you're going to run that strategy, you need to understand your team can't be the junior varsity, right? You, you need to have the best team on the field. Uh, and, and then you can compete and you can be successful. I, I, but I'll wrap it up by saying all these other short-term advantages in the long term will only have a negative impact to your business. And we never ask for tax incentives to hire people because they'll give them to somebody else. So at the end of the day, we both got them. So what do you have? You got nothing. You think they're only going to give them to you? Ira, you're the only <laughs> one. You're my friend. I'm in Becky. I'm in, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm in Nairobi in Kenya. You're my friend, Sam. You're my friend. I only give it to, you only give it to me. You know, Amy walks in next. Amy's my friend. I only give it to Amy. By the time you leave, 12 people have it. You know, right? So it, it's, my point is argue for a level playing field. Thank you. All right, let's try and go for a second round of, of questions. Sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, some of the aspects of our question have actually been touched upon to do with innovation. And we're looking at uh, particularly African, uh, the old developing countries for that matter. Um, how would developing countries focus more on realizing growth from innovation when you look at things that are happening in terms of digital platforms like Uber and Facebook. Uh, there's a lot of innovation happening in Africa, for instance, with uh, Pesa, among other platforms, but the pace is not quite there yet. So how do you see developing countries making the most of this? Innovation? Yeah. Well, well, I think the a good thing to study is why does innovation occur so fast in, say, Silicon Valley or innovation hubs in the United States? versus other portions of the United States, versus other portions of the world. So what drives that idea factory, right, there, that versus other places? Because you could benchmark, quite honestly, West Coast, East Coast, the U.S., and get a different dynamic. Not Africa to West Coast, I understand. But what is the fundamental driver? And, the, and it gets down to, quite honestly, people. I mean, at the end of the day, you have people who really were, in many ways, uh, role, uh, originals. Uh, they think about breakthrough ideas and breakthrough approaches. Uh, they, they like to view themselves as disruptors. They're very smart. I mean, you know, you go through Steve Jobs at Apple, a brilliant designer. Bill Gates, and I worked with all these people in my generation. Bill Gates at Microsoft, great, phenomenal engineer. I mean, Jobs a better designer, Bill a better engineer, but both terrific people. And they were breakthrough, risk-taking, risk-oriented. That's true. You can find those in all your countries, by the way. That's not unique to Americans. What the difference is, is the support system that lets them be that way. And what is that? Well, you have a combination of universities. You know, whether it doesn't have to be research universities. So there happens to be a great one out in the West Coast that everybody loves called Stanford. Uh, but there are also others, by the way. There's great ones up in Boston, as we know, right? So 128 would be the equivalent of Silicon Valley if I go to my Boston colleagues, right? But, so, but my point being, so you have these university environments that let innovation thrive. They don't try to create a mold. Some other, you guys know this around the world, some other academic environments have a role model mold that they try to put people into that restricts a little bit of this crazy behavior. And these people do crazy things. Okay, IBM research people, not just guys I'm talking about, do lots of crazy things. The guy that invented Watson does a lot, did a lot of crazy things, right? You know, so you have to have a culture that allows that to occur. The other thing you have is you have to have capital flows, i.e. the venture community, where you can get risk capital and lose it all. And that's okay. You try it again. You know, right? You don't personally 
bankrupt yourself as an individual because the capital flow model, the funding models, let you take risk. And the people that are the investors in that environment understand that. And they know that they only want one of 10 to work. So they're willing to, if one works, they'll go bet on nine. Uh, an example, uh, a friend of mine, a very close personal friend, was, one, was the original investor in Facebook. Did okay. His stock price, his cost for his Facebook stock is five US cents, not dollars, cents. He did okay. And however, he'll take you through 30 where he didn't do okay, right? So one Facebook offset 10 years of bad investments. You know, one deal. Now he never stopped making more investments because he understands there's risk, but nonetheless, it's an example of how capital flows. So you have a university environment that, that creates these cultures of innovation, allows it to occur. A lot of the kids drop out of school too, by the way, that's okay. Then you have a capital flow model and you still have today, although it's gotten harder, very easy for you to start a business from a permitting regulatory perspective in the United States. It is much harder today than it was 10 years ago, but I guarantee you in the next two years it's gonna be like it was 10 years ago. So that's all gonna change. So the ability to create a business will be very fast again in the United States. So what you got was government, making things happen quickly, people that are willing to risk some capital, and an academic system that created these original kinds of folks. That's what drives it. So that works. Now let's go think about what's, does that, is that unique to Northern California or to this area called 128 in, in Massachusetts or Boston, or now it's, there's a hub in New York, is it unique? No, of course not. Of course not. It's not unique. But to do it, you have to have those three legs of that stool. That's what's unique. And so uh, the people there, trust me, aren't any smarter than the people where you guys live. It's not about that. They're not any smarter. They just have an environment that creates opportunity for them to do unique and creative things. Um, our next question is, um, if you look at digital models, digital business models, they've been killing the brick and mortar business models more and more. Um, what do you think will kill the digital business model? <laughs> well, uh, that's a great question. Um, well, let me come at it this way. These business models, these technological business models have about a 20 to 25 year run if you study them. So literally about a quarter of a century is their run. Uh, and having said that, it's a lot faster than, that's historically. So let's make it 15 to 20 years today because these things are going so fast. So what would in many ways kill this model that they have? Which literally, if you think about the model, the, all the digital model does is take out inefficiencies, linkages. It takes out points of interaction that drive up costs. That's really all it does. And then if you get to be really big, you get a control point, i.e. Amazon and retail and Prime. That only occurred because they got large. They got large because they got rid of all the friction Let's call this the inability to, you had to walk into a store, you had inventory in a store, you had brick and mortar, you had therefore merchandising, marketing, all those sorts of things. When they digitalized all that and did everything on the web, all that cost goes away. Now, is that much different than what Sam Walton did with Walmart? I mean, I met with Sam Walton years ago when I was a kid, and we, he was, then he was the wealthiest man in America before he gave his fortune away to his children and his grandchildren. So we asked Sam, I said, Sam, what did you do? He said, it was very simple. He said, if I could use your technology, in those days, point of sale, and have a more efficient supply chain than my competitors, I would have 4% more financial flexibility, 4% was the number, than they have. And this is my strategy, everyday low prices. I give two to you, the consumer, and I keep two for myself. The two may be the richest man in the world. That's what it was, all it was. That was point of sale, right? We still have point of sale, by the way, right? Now you click on your payment system, it's no longer scanned, you click online. It's still a digital interaction of payment. Two, it's been updated and modified for the web. Vast inventories, 
Remember Amazon in the beginning didn't have warehouses. And then Jeff said, hey, I gotta build warehouses. I can't do service levels without warehouses. This is before he ever got the prime. He thought he was gonna, his speech was, we will never have a warehouse. Well, then he realized, well, you can't have service levels regionally if you don't have warehouses. So he has warehouses, okay? His warehouse is like really automated. You go to his warehouse, there's no people in those warehouses, by the way, you know, right? But, but that's what it is. So you go through that model, what friction points would you remove in the next level of this technology? I think the friction points will be, it will be removed in this phase, which you can do in the next level of technology, which is starting to emerge today, is tightly connect with your consumer. You, as an individual, you, not as a category, not as a millennial, a category, whatever millennial, I have four of them, so I don't even know what it means, but anyway, my own children are millennial. I have four of them. I mean, I know how they behave, uh, it, whatever, right? Generation Y, Generation Z, I'm the old guy on art. Ameri you know, I'm the old retirement society guy. They have categories, right? Blah, 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 all these big categories. You could take in this technology today to the individual of one. For example, drugs. Right, not, not what kind of shirt you wear, drugs. The average design point for a drug today that gets through the FDA is it works in 70% of the case, 70%, seven, oh. Not exactly a high number, right? You could design drugs in the future that work for your biochemistry, for you as an individual, like they do in cancer treatments today. But that could become pharmaceuticals. So that would be the next wave, is how do you connect to the individual? How do they know what, yours, what your interests and your likes are and how do they provide service to you for things that you find difficult to do for yourself? Another business model. What does that happen to be? I don't think it's telling Siri to play you your favorite song in your apartment or your house or your flat, right? I don't think that's it. I do think there are many things, if you are, say, a working mother, that if you could have individual customized connoisseur services based upon technology, that makes it easier for you to balance both the challenge of children and the challenge of a career, that's a hit. And nobody's figured that out yet, but that's a hit, you know, right? Uh, there's been experiments I've seen before in the consulting business, concierge services for consultants at McKinsey and Bain and BCG, et cetera, but they've never really solved this dynamic between the working woman and her family. So I take one scientifically based, pharma, biotech. I take one kind of life experience based. That'll be what the change will be. But the way you get there is a vast amount of data. Think about how much you had to know about the human genome and Iris human genome, which is different than Sam's human genome and Amy's human genome, to come up with this drug that solved your type of cancer, whatever it happened to be, versus the case of 70%. Go back to the working woman. Everyone has a different dynamic in that piece of data. They're not all the same. Where they live, the circumstances, their family, support systems, in-laws, grandparents, it's all different, right? Ages of the children, ac academic needs, it's all completely different. Massive data problem, right? So, so when people talk about that the big data or data analytics is gonna change everything, I would just suggest that there's two ways to focus on it. You can become the data scientist, and there's a huge opportunity for like lots of data scientists, and the price points are off the charts. I mean, like I said, I'm involved <coughs> in these startups. It's ridiculous what you have to pay these people to get them to work yeah. in these engineering disciplines. It's out of control. It's worse than bankers. I, mean, I, I, I know for you guys that want to go work at Goldman Sachs or someplace or Barclays or wherever you happen to be around the world, Sundendere, whatever, right? It's worse than that now, if you're a good data scientist, as far as the comp plan is concerned. Well, it's good for you, by the way. It's bad about the investor, it's good for you. But anyway, my point being, though, is if you could, on the other side of it, because then everybody's going to be the genius that did Watson, like Dave Ferrucci. But it, it, the other side of this equation is if you could think about the implications to the business model, and I used two, I think, that I've just kind of made up right here and now, but there are lots of those things. There'll be lots of those things, you know, right? That, that knows your needs, so when you walk out of your flat, your, your, your ride share is there. You didn't have to text it, because it's, it's the same every day. It's there, it takes you, it's all friction free. But that's a lot of, that's a big data piece of analysis. Oh, fascinating. All right. All right, let's go to uh, Aisa. Thank you, Mr. Polizano. Um, actually, Alberta had a great question lined up, but 
Uh, his thunder was, was stolen by my colleague from BU, so... Give him an A-plus. Give him an A-plus. I'm not really giving much. Um, so I'll, I'll step in instead and sort of uh, switch gears perhaps a little bit. And um, talking about global trends, um, I think uh, pretty clearly cybersecurity uh, now at a global level is becoming uh, a huge uh, factor. Um, and I think you've been involved uh, and working on this uh, recently, so it would be great to hear a little bit of your opinion on this. Um, yep. So the question is right. really, it's really on, on, two, on two facets. Uh, on one hand, I think most computer scientists would, would think about cybersecurity as, as a technical issue. Um, but I was struck by a quote by President Obama, which uh, I think he said something like, every single email I write, uh, I assume the whole world could be, right? So I think his solution, rather than being technical, is really about us adapting to a hyper-transparent world where uh, quite literally information is about us is, is widely available. Uh, yeah. So uh, I'd like to hear your, your opinion about sort of these, these two, these two uh, points of view, and of course the implications for, for business as well, because right. uh, for now the cybersecurity issues seem to have impacted uh, the political arena. Uh, but at the same rate, it actually have a huge impact on this. Yeah, I, I actually think, on, to your point of impact, the economic impact of cybersecurity is going to be greater than an election, if it's not solved. Because we're only in the beginning of this new phase called the Internet of Things, where everything has a computer in it. Everything is now a computer. So it's pacemakers, Fitbits that you wear on your wrist for exercise, cameras, sensors, your whole life is going to be a computer. And, and, it, and it's moving, it's billions of them and going like crazy all over the world. This is not just strictly an advanced economy point of view, right? So, so quite honestly, I know that having been involved with this, I was the vice chair of the commission that Obama created for cybersecurity. We were there during the Russian hack. We were working on stuff. We did not get involved in the Russian hack. And I'm not saying that, you know, elections aren't important. Of course elections are important, but you didn't, in elections, so far we haven't damaged society as yet, right? As I say, if you get this other thing wrong and you start killing people, that's a bigger deal, right? And I tried to, exp I tried to ex express my point of view to my friends that were lay people uh, that I worked with in this cybersecurity commission. Why don't we start with the first, our first level of priority is no one dies. That's the first, you don't die. Then we'll work down the personal convenience that your photo get lost. I know you like to post your photos, they didn't get lost. So we have an extreme range of technology. You didn't die, you didn't, you didn't take a drone and crash into a building and blow something up, you didn't take a self-driving car and kill five people in a park, you didn't, you know, people dying, all right? You don't blow up nuclear facilities or critical infrastructure. This is, I mean, I'm not trying to scare you, but I'd start with that as the priority and work my way down to social media and whether your tweet got there or not. Your 144 characters, you could go resend. Okay, right? I understand. Now the politicians would re-rank that. I got it. Okay, because they like these things, that their photos and their sound bites. But nonetheless, that's not pick on the politicians. So, if you look at it through that dimension, and you add to that dimension the fact that what mostly causes the problems today, 80% of the issue as far as exposure to being hack cyber attacked or hacked right is personal hygiene passwords password protection authentication for example the democratic hat the chief of staff to the presidential candidate mrs clinton's password was the word password you didn't have to be a nation state to hack someone whose password is password, or mom, or dad, or your dog's name. So I'm sure you kids aren't using any of those because you're too smart, you're too digitally savvy, but a lot of people do. Your birth date, for example. So hygiene is 80% today, right? Now all this other stuff gets discussed around the technology and there are things that we need to do in the technology and I'll go there next. But the most important thing for the individual is just hygiene. Be aware of the risk, so that's education. And one of the things we recommended in the commission, education starts at like the first grade, I mean, when you're six or seven years old. 
because I know I'll change it. It's great. School systems are different around the world, but six or seven years old, you are beginning to be trained on the internet and the importance of, you know, like, don't talk to strangers, right? If you're a young kid, well, don't do these kinds of things on the internet. No different than don't talk to a stranger. No different than if you're in a forest, smoking a bear, don't light a match if it's dry, you know, right? Or don't leave a forest, I mean, you're burning, your campsite fire burning, you know? Basic stuff that we've solved over the years has to happen here as well. So it's awareness and education of people as to just how they should conduct themselves in this transparent digital world. How do you conduct yourselves? Now, along those lines, there's some technology things, and I'm going to stay consumer before I get to governments and institutions. But on consumer, there are quickly some things you could do. The simplest thing you could do is have what's called dual level authentication. I, when you swipe your credit card today, that's one level of authentication. Then you put in some personal identifier. And in the United States, it's your zip code or the town you live in. Something that matches, it's two, it's not just one. <clears throat> so in addition to your password, dual level. If the government required dual level authentication for everything that you interface with with government, 80% of the population would use dual level authentication because everybody, government touches everybody driver's license, property tax, your, your retirement income, everything. So you would, you, you would address, a, if the government would just insist upon dual level authentication and password changing, you'd solve a lot of these problems that's from a, and educate the consumer. So that's that piece. On the enterprise piece, um, there are lots of standards now that exist on what enterprises should be doing to make sure that they are protecting themselves from a cyber attack. Um, and there's a standard in the United States that comes from the Department of Commerce called the NIST standard, but it works around the world. It's publicly available. Uh, and a lot of companies now around the world are adopting these standards because it really is a way to manage enterprise risk. If you follow the standards, they're all on the internet, go to the us.gov site for Commerce Department, NIST standards, it's all there, right? That will again address a lot of the problems. Uh, However, it doesn't mean that incidents won't occur. So I'm going to go to now something has occurred. So if you're a company, look at these things, these standards. They work. You can, you can have different ones in the EU if you like. It doesn't matter. Have some standard. You have this thing now, and if you're a public company, because you have to have an audit committee, do an enterprise risk assessment. So the board has to go through where you are. And that'll cause things to change. You know, that will make progress because of that. that those process changes will get corporate America or the corporate world up to speed if they do those kinds of things. Now something has happened, right? Now you, gotta, you actually have an event. And then this is where it gets complicated because you have an event. And the first thing you have to be able to, now private sector view, then the government's view. Let me start the private sector view, it's less scary. Private sector view of the event is that basically you have to have what's known as information sharing in a way where you're protected legally from any kind of suits. So if you see an event and you're a bank and you share it with your colleagues in the banking system and you share it with the FBI or the authorities, the, the, you know, the, uh, the authorities in the United States, you cannot be sued because you lost some credit cards in your database because you shared it immediately. So it didn't happen to 10 banks, it didn't happen to 5 million cards, it happened to maybe 100 cards, you know, those kinds of things information sharing. The final one, which is much more complicated, is nation states. Nation states do bad things. And oh, by the way, all countries spy on each other. Let's not be naive. So if any of you think that your country's not spying on somebody, trust me. I was in all those, I have my top secret clearances. Everybody spies on each other. It's been going on for hundreds of years. There's nothing new here, okay? They're all spying on each other. The question is, what do you do once you spy on somebody? It's not that you're spying and listening in the phone calls. Everybody is. So then, therefore, when something occurs, what, what is the action plan? This is where it gets complicated because you need to have collaboration on a global basis. Because if it really is a rogue nation who's an outlier to international standards, or whatever those standards happen to be, human societal standards, prisoner of war standards, there's all kinds of standards. If they're outliers on those standards, then fundamentally you have to have a mechanism to literally convene, convene both locally and internationally 
and come up with a plan to respond. If it's something where you have to respond quickly, you have to have mechanisms in place to do so. This gets, and I, you know, I'll wrap it up here because it, it gets very, I've been in meetings where people have looked at these things occurring and have asked the question, is this an act of war or is it a criminal offense? Now it's getting hard, right? But this is what countries have to do. They have to make that determination. In the simulation, they had 40 minutes to do it. It's not a lot of the time to decide whether it's an act of war or not. The old days, you could see the missile. It's going to take some amount of time to get to you, right? And you could, you could take it out. This is all moving at the speed of light. So they need to have mechanisms, and that's technology mechanisms and international collaboration agreements so that these nations, these like-minded nations who comply with international standards, like pretty much everybody on the phone today, your countries, uh, can get together and respond and deal with rogue nations or nation states if they're doing things that could be very disruptive and harmful to society at large. Good. Thank you, Sam. Was that uh, too, long, too long, I guess? <laughs> <laughs> no, we're going to have to wrap it up. Okay. And uh, I'm sorry that we didn't get to uh, everyone's second question. Uh, we want to thank you again for participating. I hope you enjoyed this discussion. I know we found it uh, fascinating. The questions were great. And uh, we will post this uh, video on YouTube. Uh, in a couple of days, uh, so uh, you can catch up and uh, rewatch. Again, thank you for participating. Thank you guys for your attention.